Nobody suspected a tale of ill repute from behind the walls of this hotel. But in September 2003, this luxury hotel in Zhahai, southern China, became the center of a huge controversy. A Japanese tourist group had brought back 500 Chinese prostitutes. In itself, this was nothing unusual, except for the date, 18th of September. This was the infamous day in 1931 remembered by all Chinese when Japan began her occupation of China. China was outraged. The scandal brought back memories of the barbaric treatment of Chinese women during the occupation, when tens of thousands had been used as prostitutes by Japanese soldiers. It took more than 50 years for Japan to offer an apology. Punishment for the Chinese organizers of the orgy, however, was harsh. Two men received life sentences for their role in the act. The scandal sparked a huge international crisis. The recent freeze in diplomacy is a new low in relations between the two countries, stemming in large part from the governments themselves. But public opinion in both Japan and China is calling for more harmony. It's ironic that anti-Japanese feeling is being stirred up while Chinese history and the death toll of Chinese at the hands of their own government is being glossed over. It's impossible to justify Japan's refusal to face its Second World War history. The Europeans and Germans have managed a lot better. But the Chinese, too, aren't looking at their own bloody past. We know from the Communist Black Book that the KPCH took up to 70 million lives as part of their rise to power. 70 million. That's a lot of people. It is possible it was only 45, but there is naturally a difference in top estimates. You simply can't talk about it in China. There have been no charges brought, nor even discussions within the KP about its own role in history. Instead, the KP are playing off old Tsar communism against nationalism. It often reminds me of what happened in the 1930s in Japan. That is, an extreme nationalistic undercurrent widespread throughout society. That's the actual problem, not the few students who demonstrate nowadays. This nationalism is not being reined in anymore in China. And this nationalism is developing, just as it was in Japan in the 1930s and in Germany in the 1920s and 30s, out of economic problems. And it could gain a foothold very quickly in China. Japanese historians see little in the controversy. The Japanese emperor himself was jointly responsible for the nationalism of the 1930s, and the imperial wars were no different to those of other colonial powers. Japanese incursions into China and the massacre of thousands of Chinese are even denied today by many politicians and historians. Events such as the 1937 massacre at Nanking are played down as minor incidents. Opposition to this historical falsification has come almost exclusively from abroad, mainly from China. A visit by the Japanese political elite to this controversial Yasukuni shrine in Tokyo, which honors what China considers to be war criminals, was also sharply condemned. Some protests by Beijing were successful. From the middle of the 1990s, Japanese schools had to stop talking about Nanking, but instead moved to war crimes perpetrated by the Japanese military. But since the premiership of Kazumi, there has been a swing to the right. Nowadays, only one in eight school books mention the true number of victims at Nanking. There's no mention of guilt or atonement in any. There was a war crimes trial in Tokyo, like there was in Nuremberg, but the criminals were tried by the Allies, not by Japan itself. 
that is, the topic was quickly suppressed. Japan did not argue with it. That still has a lasting effect today because the Japanese see themselves as victims and not as perpetrators. While Germany since the war has thought a lot about the issue and brought to account those who needed to be brought to account, that never happened in Japan. That's one of the big problems. As long as Kazumi has power here, little is likely to change. In fact, the opposite is more likely. A small apology to the Chinese met with muted response, and the feeling is that Kazumi is hell-bent on rivalry with China. Shortly before the historic apology, a Japanese court once again rejected a request for compensation to Chinese war victims. Kazumi remains hard because he believes historical controversy should be focused elsewhere in Asia. Then you can't forget that China wants to be a world superpower and projects its strength, but it is up against another world power in the region. The Japanese have had their post-war condition that they should not send any troops overseas. But despite this, it still has a very powerful army, the second most powerful army in the world. That's also true of raw materials, of economic power, and is even true of Taiwan. We mustn't forget that Taiwan is the focus of this whole conflict. The Chinese want to tell the Japanese, don't support Taiwan, it's part of our empire. And that's the crux of the whole affair. In the West, you forget that very quickly, but in Eastern Asia, everyone understands. Taiwan is a hot topic ostensibly because of the vast gas fields nearby, claimed by both China and Japan. Both countries are dependent on imports. Japan, in particular, lacks many of the raw materials it needs. Experts refuse to rule out Chinese military intervention in the region. The Taiwanese conflict could give the new regime the chance to make its mark. The current change in the Chinese leadership from the old guard of Yang Ximin which still had ties to the civil war, to the new guard of Hu Jintao, went smoothly. But Jintao's position is not yet as strong as those in the West would like to see, and they are always trying to intervene in China. Hu Jintao still hasn't injected any power into the military, and the military isn't perfectly under his control. It's always been said that a strong man has to have a war to bring his army under his control. Mao Zedong got involved in the Korea War and that cost a million Chinese lives. Many people have forgotten that Deng Xiaoping attacked Vietnam in the mid to late 1970s. Now many military strategists fear that Hu Jintao will use a possible war with Taiwan both to bring his army under his control and, above all, to strengthen it. So befürchten einige Militärstrategen in Asien braucht den Konflikt gegen Taiwan, um seine Macht in der Armee, in der Volksbefreiungsarmee zu sichern und zu festigen vor allen Dingen. At present, there are no serious signs of a military incursion. As such, the Beijing government is limited to protests. Room for compromise is narrowing by the day. Both China and Japan fear the crisis could affect their image with international investors and trade partners. The danger is that the two great Asiatic powers could fall into a serious standoff where no one could predict the consequences. <laughs>